Well, good morning. Welcome to Midlands Church. I'm Hart Trailer, and I'm one of the elders here. I hope you're doing well. I wish we were gathered together in person today uh, so we could worship our awesome God together. Uh, but thank you so much for your patience and your flexibility this week. As we share with y'all the other day, uh, just based on the timing and the circumstances, we felt like the best decision was to move everything to online for this week. But we are hopeful that, Lord willing, we will be back together in person next Sunday, July 5th. Uh, we'll certainly keep you posted if those plans end up changing, but that's what we're planning at the moment. Uh, but before we get started with today's worship, we have a few announcements for y'all. First, ladies, you are invited to a socially distanced pool party on Thursday, July 9th. It'll be at my parents' house, Harry and Jane Trailers, and the church will send out an email in the coming weeks with their address, but you're also welcome to reach out to the church or to me or Vanessa for their address. Uh, but plan to come on Thursday, July 9th at 6.30 p.m. and enjoy a relaxing time by the pool with other ladies from Midlands. Now, obviously, this will be during dinner time, so feel free to eat before you come or bring your food with you and eat it by the pool. Uh, the church is going to provide bottled water and some canned drink options and there will also be individually wrapped ice cream treats available. Now in order to social distance y'all will spend this time outside but just know that you will have access to a bathroom inside and of course don't forget the essentials like your towel and your sunscreen. Uh, so we hope you ladies will come and enjoy this time together. Second, we are planning to have a family meeting on Sunday, July 12th. At this point, the plan is to have the meeting following the service at Glen Forest. But of course, if those plans get changed, we will certainly let you know. Uh, these quarterly family meetings are a great way to hear the latest news at Midlands and also give you an opportunity to ask any questions that you may have. And parents, just keep in mind, as always, we do not provide child care uh, during these meetings. Um, also, our plan is to live stream the meeting. So if you're not able to attend, hopefully we will have it available for you to watch. Speaking of July 12th, we are planning to resume offering an in-person Kidlands Elementary class beginning Sunday, July 12th. Now, please note, this is only for our elementary class. We will not be providing infant or two to four classes at this time. So what this means is all children will join us in the service, but then prior to the sermon, any elementary age children will be given the opportunity to be dismissed to go to their class. Now, parents, if your child or children plan to attend the class, uh, we do ask that for safety purposes and also just to limit distractions when they're dismissed, to go ahead and check them in prior to the service and not wait to do that when they're dismissed. Also, going along with Kidlands, we do have several Kidlands needs we want to make you aware of. First, we do need help with unpacking and setting up some final things, and we also need help with doing some deep clean. Uh, we need people handy with tools to help with a couple handyman-related projects, and we need some additional teachers for our elementary class. So if you're willing to help with any of those things or all of those things, please reach out to Amanda or myself and let us know. And then also because of the coronavirus, uh, you may have noticed cleaning supplies have been a hot commodity. And there are some specific chemical free, safe cleaning supplies that we use specifically in our infant room. And we've been having a hard time finding those. Uh, so this coming week, we're going to send out an email with a list of those supplies that we need. And if you happen to have those and you're willing to donate them to the church, that would be great. Or as you're out shopping and you happen to see those in stock, if you'd be willing to purchase those and get those to the church, then we'd be happy to reimburse you for that. But it would be a huge help if you'd be able to keep an eye out for these things to help us stock up on these supplies. So again, keep an eye out for that email this week that's going to list what those supplies are. And then for our last announcement, we want to formally welcome and introduce our newest members. And this has been a long time coming for this particular group. And now just to remind you how the membership process works at Midlands, uh, we offer several times throughout the year a membership class, and we typically have a number of people who attend this class. After the class, individuals will then schedule a time to meet with some or all of the elders for an interview. And assuming all of that goes well, then after the interview, they officially become members at Midlands. And what that means is they can enjoy the benefits of being a member here. And this includes being able to make nominations for deacons and elders. They can take part in church votes and they themselves can be considered for various leadership roles. 
But as you can imagine, if we have a number of people attend the class and then trying to schedule interviews, it can get a little crazy trying to coordinate everyone's schedules. And so it can take some time to get everyone from start to finish. But once we do, we then like to formally introduce this newest group of members to the church. Uh, but again, because it can take some time to, to finish that process, uh, the introduction is not part of the membership process. So when these members are introduced, by that point, they've already officially become members. And sometimes they've already been members for maybe a few months. And with today's group that we're introducing, they've been waiting a while to be introduced. Several people in this group have been members at this point for six or seven months. Uh, we were actually trying to formally present them back in March, but the Sunday that we were scheduled to do it was actually the very first Sunday that we had to switch to online because of the coronavirus. Uh, and so we postponed the introduction because ideally we wanted to do this in person. And then as you know, three months passed. So we finally started gathering back together. And so we finally got this on the calendar, had it scheduled and we were scheduled to do that today. And then of course we ended up moving back to online for this week. And we elders, we didn't wanna postpone this again. So we decided let's just do this online. So thankfully most of the group uh, was able to, at the last minute, hop onto a Zoom call with me. Uh, and so I think it's fitting that with the season that we've been in and with how much we have utilized Zoom lately that we're going to be introducing our newest members via Zoom. Now two things I wanna mention quickly first, during this introduction, I'm going to read the church covenant and give them an opportunity to formally affirm the covenant before the rest of the church. And we do that at all of these formal introductions. Uh, but during this time, we always want to encourage you not to check out. We always take time to review the church covenant in the membership class. And we share how our desire is for Midlands to be a healthy church. And in order for that to happen, we need healthy members. And we believe that if we're all committed to pursuing the things outlined in the church covenant, then we'll be on the right track for that. So if you're a member at Midlands, remember that we too have agreed to commit ourselves to this covenant. So use this as an opportunity to reflect on these words and how we ought to participate as members at Midlands. And then the other thing I wanna mention, it's kind of small and insignificant, but apparently uh, the location of people's boxes on Zoom when you're seeing it live can be different from what the final recorded version is. And that's what happened to me. So please ignore the fact that a few times people's boxes are not in the location that I say they are. All right, without further ado, here are our newest members. All right, well, I am here with our newest members. And, uh, it, and many of them probably look very familiar to you guys uh, because a lot of them have been around for a while and they've even been members for a while, but it has taken a while for us to be able to formally introduce them. So that is what we are finally getting around to doing today is formally introducing our newest members. And so I'll kind of work my way through uh, starting in the top left corner. So we got up there, we got David Frederick and Sarah Knight and they are engaged and actually getting married July 23rd, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. so we're really excited about that. And then below them, we've got the McGoldrick family. We've got Will and Christina, and their daughter Leah is also joining. Next to them, we've got CJ Franklin. Uh, then bottom left, we've got Tim and Natalie David and sweet little baby Julian with them. And then the bottom right, we, also, we have um, Kessler Derrick. Uh, and then Caleb Brower also joined. <laughs> but he was not able to make it for this. Um, but we're so excited to have all you guys joining the church and, and a part of our church. So I'm going to read the, uh, the church covenant to you guys now. We acknowledge that we are sinners, justly deserving eternal separation from God and without the ability to save ourselves. We believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and trust him alone as our Savior and Lord. We commit in humble reliance on the grace of the Holy Spirit to pursue a deepening intimacy with God. We commit to meet together regularly, <clears throat> to worship God, to study scripture, to pray and care for one another and protect the reputation of each other by refraining from gossip and slander, being gracious, gentle, and kind toward one another and forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven us. We commit to actively serve in the life of this local church by using our God-given spiritual gifts and talents. We commit to regularly give financially to this church body. We commit to share the good news of Jesus Christ with others in Columbia and beyond through our encouragement, prayers, finances, and personal involvement. 
and we submit to the leadership and discipline of this local church, and we promise to support the beliefs, vision, and values of this church. Do you agree to this? We do. I do. We do. Awesome. Well, again, we are thrilled to have you all part of Midlands Church. I just want to again say thank you so much for being flexible and willing to let us get a little creative and introduce you guys in this unique way. So we're, we're so thrilled to have you as part of our church and, and to our members, to our other members at Midlands. We want to encourage you once we get back together, Lord willing, next week, please reach out if you don't already know these, these people, these families, and please reach out and get to know them. All right. Now for our call to worship. Our call to worship today comes from Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Amen. Midlands Church. I was asked by the elders to pray, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that you have sent your Son to be the cornerstone and that our lives are built on the rock of Christ. Lord, it would appear as though the winds of change are blowing all over the world and we could be unsettled, but the fact that we have you as our foundation, we are secure. 
Your word also makes it clear that we should ask for wisdom. So, Father, as Midlands Church, we are asking for your wisdom to know how to proceed, how to engage in our community so that your name can be glorified. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Our reading today is uh, 1 John 2, 12 through 17. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, 
because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anybody loves the world, the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away, along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Hey, Midlands family. I uh, hope you're all doing well. Um, it's probably already been said uh, earlier in uh, the video this morning, but really just want to say thank you uh, for your flexibility and uh, your patience and just your willingness to, to work with us on um, just trying to do what we need to do to keep people safe. Uh, interesting times, and um, I've, I've just always been very, very thankful for Midlands that um, uh, we kind of are able to do things on the fly, and I appreciate that. And and um, you know, been, there have been times when we've actually made a change of location, and uh, within the last, you know, 12 hours before our service, and one time a few years back, and and we ended up having the largest um, attendance that we had had to that point. And uh, everything was set up and ran smooth. And so I just want to uh, say in the elders, we'd just like to say thank you for, um, for your understanding. Um, so this morning, as we get into um, our study time, um, you know, we're in the book of First John. And when we first started this summer series, Hart talked about that John, the gospel that we've been working through, through is really so that people will believe and John says that so that you may believe and that's the title that we've given that sermon or that sermon series but this one is actually written these letters are written to the church written to believers and it's about how to behave and their expectations and what God's calling them to do um, but it's also to remind them of what God has done for them through Jesus and so as we work through um, this summer series uh, it's exciting to think about that and uh, the title of our sermon today is called love letters and I chose that title not it's not obviously it's not a love letter like a romantic love letter but it's um, just when you care about somebody that you will write letters to them and letter writing has kind of gone out of style um, I don't remember the last time that I wrote a letter to someone uh, probably the closest I came was writing a couple sentences in a card um, but I used to write letters, and letters used to be a lot more prominent than they are now, uh, going back to this time and before. Um, growing up, uh, I would um, remember letters from my grandparents uh, to my parents and to me, and uh, I remember when I was in college, uh, it was a little, little different time, and uh, so instead of having a cell phone or, you know, a computer or, or things to be able to connect with people that way, um, I actually got excited every day going to the post office on campus to my P.O. box to see if I had a letter that somebody had written to me. Um, I've read a lot of biographies and biographies, uh, especially uh, for um, folks that have passed away that are maybe lived uh, 50, 100, 200 years ago, the way that we know about them and the things in their life. A lot of the things that we know are from their journals and from their letters, both letters they wrote and letters they received. So letters are things that um, that uh, we don't do as much as we used to. But letters were written, and it could be because letters, um, they, they take time to write. Um, and But in, in John's day, um, and, and throughout history, when you write a letter to someone, a lot of times it's because you really do care about them and you're trying to share with them your thoughts and your emotions and things. So, so that's what these are. These are um, love letters that John has written to the people that he loves, the church. And so he is sharing with them he, the same way that a shepherd would care for his, uh, his flock. Um, and he's trying to help them through uh, some difficult times that are going on. And I think we can relate to that now because um, it's a difficult time in, in our country and in our world. Um, there is unrest, there is uh, the, the coronavirus, uh, and the uncertainties that go along with that. And then just our world. Uh, we are, um, our world is moving further and further 
uh, opposed to God. Um, uh, it always has been, but it's been more and more prominent and more and more uh, clear that there is a separation there. And uh, so John's writing these letters, and you can tell he's writing to people that he that he loves because he calls them that. He calls them beloved and uh, whom I love, and calls them little children, my little children, um, throughout these uh, these three letters. So he's he's sharing with them um, because he loves them, and because he loves them, he's also he writes very boldly. He he is letting them know uh, what the expectations are um, of a believer. Um, but he's, he's being very bold with them because he loves them very much, just like a dad and a mom would do uh, for their children. So last week's passage that Bala covered, um, it was pretty serious and very, very convicting. Um, and it, it talked about one key, key way that Christians um, obey God is by loving other uh, believers. And, um, and it, it said, let me, let me read in verses um, 9 through 11 from last week, just as a reminder. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness, and whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So that's very serious, uh, very bold, what John is doing and sharing with uh, with the church there, um, and one of the things that John has done as we've gone and looked through these last few weeks, uh, the first part of of um, First John, is uh, is is it is very direct and it is very bold, and he's trying to help them understand um, how to deal with the challenges of being uh, in the world but not not of the world, and so. As he's doing this, um, he, he actually takes a break. Um, so he goes, and at the beginning of the letter, he jumps right into his instruction and letting them know uh, the things that he's trying to, to share with them. And then he takes a little bit of a break here in these first three verses that we're going to cover this week. Um, and he is addressing them. He's addressing them to what, what seems to be three groups, but it's actually two, two groups, technically. But we'll talk a little bit about those different groups. So... Um, let me read it real quick, read those three verses. So this is John, and he's, he's just laid some pretty serious, pretty heavy uh, um, instructions on them. And then he says, I am writing to you. So he, he takes a break from his, from his letter to explain why he's writing the letter to him. So he says, I am writing you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. And I'm writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. So let, let's stop there real quick and, and talk about those three different audiences that it sounds like he is talking to. So the, the term, the Greek word um, technia for little children that is uh, what's translated here is only found in John's writings and it always seems to be a, this term of endearment, like it's always, you know, my children, and it's it, this this compassion, this love, this intimate, you know, relationship between him and the church that he's talking to. And then um, in uh, the end part of verse 13, he actually just said he leaves off the little, and the word that's translated children there is pedia. Um, and that term, as it's used throughout John's writings, it, it really demonstrates a uh, love and a fatherly concern so he is he is talking to uh the who he calls little children and children but he's not referring to based on what we have seen and see throughout these letters he's not referring to uh actual children he is referring to the whole church as his children he as the the fatherly figure the pastoral figure for them and he is calling them his beloved, his little children, as he is instructing them. So, so that that term, little children and children, is is used to to address the the whole church there. And then he talks about fathers. He directs um, a, a verse or two there to fathers, and fathers, especially in the ancient world, was a term of respect. Um, fathers were um, whether it was a your physical father or a father figure. Um, it was someone that cared for you, someone that would lead you, and that would be an example for you. So 
our church fathers, our, our, our dads, our grandfathers. Um, but in the church, what he's talking about here is he's actually appealing to those that have some type of level of maturity in their faith. So maturity within the church. So uh, they could be older gentlemen, um, but it could very well just be someone who is mature in, in their faith and is a leader among that church. And then he talks to and addresses the young men. And this is the term um, translated here for somebody who's not yet, um, doesn't yet have that same type of maturity or level of maturity that the fathers have. Uh, they might be younger in age or they might just be younger in their faith. Um, so this, this term, this in, um, when the Greek, when the Old Testament was translated into Greek, this term for young men, it was also used for the spies and Joshua that were sent into Jericho, those young, bold men. And it was also used to describe Daniel and his three friends in the book of Daniel. So it, it's a phrase that talks about, and we see in the verses here, someone who's young, and, and it talks really uh, mostly points toward their potential and their promise. So John is talking to these young men um, about their potential and their promise of uh, becoming leaders and, and leading not only in their own families, but in their church, in their community as they share the gospel and grow in the truth. So in this, um, in this passage that we've read through here, uh, he's reminding them, this is, this is a passage, these verses are of uh, an, an encouragement that John is giving to the church. And he's saying to the whole church, he's like, I'm, he's reminding them, your sins are forgiven for his, for Jesus' name's sake, um, and you know the Father. So that's what he's telling the whole church. Uh, and then he tells the fathers, uh, the more mature leaders, he says, you know him who is from the beginning. And he says that in verse uh, 13, and then in verse 14, like of the three groups that he's talking to, children, fathers, and young men, um, the whole church, the fathers, and then the young men, the only thing that's identical, that's repeated uh, verbatim is the, the, uh, the language to the fathers. And he's saying, you who knew him, who he is from the beginning. So he's helping them to understand that uh, it doesn't matter uh, how old or mature you are in your faith. Just remember that um, it's, it's not what we know, it's who we know. And he's letting them know that, it, that their faith is based on Jesus who has been from the beginning. And um, so it's an encouragement to them to, to lead and be mature, but also to be humble. And remember that they uh, are only leading because God has put them in that position to do that. So some encouraging words there. And then to the young men, John reminds them that they're, they've overcome the devil. And he says that twice to them. And, and he, uh, it's a truth that actually we're going to dig into later on in some later chapters, so we won't go into it here. But um, it talks about that, that they've been able to overcome the evil one. He reminds them that they're strong um, and that they can resist the, the false teachings of the, word, of the world because the word of God abides in them. We see that in, in the second time he addresses them in verse 14. And it's because of that, it's because of the Word of God living in them that they, not on their own strength, but that strength in the Word of God has, uh, has allowed them to overcome the evil one. So these, these uh, three verses, 12 through 14, uh, come at a time where John has been very bold and very direct and very even confrontational to a certain extent um, of instruction to the church. And then he steps back, just like a dad. You know, there are times when your dad just has to tell, you, tell it like it is and tells you what you need to hear. But then your dad will take you in his arms and say, hey, you know, I love you and here, I, I've always loved you. And here are the, the things you need to remember. And so John is reminding the church, you know, wow, you're, these are the things that you need to remember. Your sins are forgiven. The word of God is in you. You've known the Father. And, these are things that, that are encouraging and should be encouraging to us today. So as he pauses here from some very direct instruction that we had uh, in the verses uh, prior to this, 
he's pausing to just encourage them and, and a reminder of these gospel truths um, that they can rest in uh, even when things around them seem crazy and just like a good dad should do and a good pastor should do so uh, we have those verses and those are the encouraging verses then we move into verses 15 through um, 17 and John's still encouraging here he's still encouraging the church but the tone returns to just being bold and direct like in verses 9 through 11 so in the first part of verse 15 it says do not love the world or the things in the world so he is telling them uh, and we need to understand what he means by the world so John uh, and the things of the world John is not saying don't love creation he's not talking about creation here um, and God clearly loves the world. We can we know that throughout Scripture. But you know, the first verse that probably comes to mind is John three sixteen. For God so loved the world. So um, what he's talking about isn't because uh, God um, loves uh, the people of the world to the point of giving His Son for them. Uh, but He doesn't love the evil of the world. And so what John's talking about here really is more about the, this system, this realm of rebellion against God that is the world and are the things of the world. So he he's mentioning um, this because uh, we know that our world that we live in today and the world that they lived in then doesn't know God. And in fact, um, in chapter 3 of this very letter, it actually says that this world um, hates believers, hates those who follow Jesus and um, it's very 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 evident in our world today now later on in this letter um, and that'll be in a, in a future sermon John talks about false teachers more about them he even talks about the Antichrist um, and obviously those are part of what this world is um, but what he's saying um, is that this whole world is actually at the end of um, first John the whole world lies in the power of the evil one so that's what he's talking about when he says do not love the world or the things of the world so he is making the point that this world is hostile towards God the Father this world that we live in is hostile towards God's Word the world is hostile toward Jesus and the world is hostile towards the church which is why he says at the end of verse 15 if anyone loves the world the love of the father is not in him so he's making that point that um, you have to make a decision you know are you going to follow the world be of the world or are you going to follow Jesus and love Jesus and love your fellow believers as uh, our, was, we are called to in verses um, 9 through 11. So when you think about this world and uh, um, it's, it's become, it's always been hostile to the truth and it's always been hostile. Jesus came into a hostile world um, and he uh, he eventually gave his life for uh, this sinful world. And uh, today when when you are sharing scripture or sharing the gospel with people, um, you can run into hostility. And uh, I was reading an article this week. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in our world, going on in our world right now, and um, unrest and hostility and uh, uh, opinions and beliefs. And, um, and people uh, want to make the truth whatever they decide it is instead of basing their truth on the word and on scripture. And I was reading an article about someone that was attacking this other person. This other person, um, you know, had specific views on, on marriage and love and creation and, uh, and those types of things. And um, the person that was talking about those things was not quoting scripture, but it was clear that their belief system uh, was based on scripture. And, um, and so the person that was criticizing that person and their view said that you can't use some antiquated view um, to define love and define marriage and to define you know what 
this is 2020, so we have to uh, be in today and be in the modern times. And uh, that word antiquated, um, it actually means out of date. And we know as believers that, that God's word is not out of date and God's word will never be out of date. But we should not be surprised that the world is going to continue. It is hostile and will continue to be uh, more and more hostile toward the truth, toward scripture. And uh, um, and as Christians, we it, it was something that was going on uh, at this time when John was writing this letter because that was the, the early days of the church and they were uh, literally, there were those that were, be, were being put to death, being martyred for their faith. And that has occurred throughout uh, church history and uh, it's still going on today. And as we look in our, in our own country, um, just uh, being a believer and following Jesus and, uh, and trusting in him, it, 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 people are hostile toward that and hostile toward our faith and hostile toward the teachings of scripture. And um, it's, it's very interesting when you hear someone talk about what love should be, and then they're missing the point of what love really is, as we can see in scripture. So as John goes on, he continues to tell them, he says, for verse 16, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, and the desires of the eyes and the pride in possessions is not from the Father, but is from this world. So um, the first two things, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes, those seem pretty self-explanatory. Um, but what's, um, what's the pride of life? So that Greek word that's translated pride there is typically used to refer to arrogant boasting. So it isn't just you know, I'm proud of myself for doing this. It's like, I, I did this, and it was me and not you. And and then the Greek word that's used here for life is actually a lot of times refers to um, either material goods or wealth or um, things like that, your uh, prosperity. And so what John is warning them against is he's like, he's warning them against a sense of self, having this self-importance that comes from pride in your possessions or your position, or your pres or prestige, um, and uh, he's he's saying don't don't uh, fall for that. Don't uh, don't put your worth in things or who you are or what your job is or um, your your um, your value, your worth is in Jesus and your relationship with Him. So he's reminding them uh, not to lose sight of that, and then in Verse 17, our last verse, says, The world is passing away along with its desires, and whoever does the will of God abides forever. So in verse 17, John's telling us, you know, not only is the world and the things of the world, those things are passing away, um, they're all opposed to God, as he says there. Um, but those things are temporary. Those things are passing away. And in contrast to that, to that, those who do the will of God abide forever, and they abide forever with God. So that's an encouraging thing. So in light of the gospel promises that he shared with his church, with his church in, um, in verses 12 through 14, um, this warning that he gives in verses 15 through 17 um, is calling them to make a decision. And it's calling us to make a decision. This letter, um, and I was going through a letter uh, last year. My mom found a letter that she had told me about, but I'd never seen it. But she found it in some of her stuff. And it was written um, from my dad to my mom a few months before they got married um, in 1957. And it actually mentions me by name um, because they had already picked out a name for a son. Now, I... Contrary to your probable beliefs, I was not born in 1957. I'm slightly younger than that. Um, I was born in 63, so this letter was written six years before I was born. But it it applied to me. It, it mentioned me. Well, this letter um, that we're studying today was written 2,000 years ago. But it applies to us today, just like it did the church of that time. They had to make a decision. Were they going to trust these gospel truths that he shared in verses 12 through 14, 
and make the decision to be obedient and to follow Jesus um, as they are called to and turn away from the world and the things of the world, as he mentions in the verses uh, 15 through 17. Um, and we have to make that decision. Do we love the things of this world that are temporary or are we going to love the things of God, the things um, that are eternal? And do we want to abide with him forever? Um, we're, we're living in some pretty interesting times that are uh, requiring Christians to, to make some decisions. Um, it's not the first time in history this has happened, but it's pretty clear that there's some, some significant things going on where we need to make some decisions about um, are we going to stand up for the truth of the gospel? Uh, are we going to remain quiet and safe? Um, I want to close this morning with just a, a brief passage, or a, um, not a passage, no, it's not a scripture passage. It's a, uh, a quote from a book, and it's by a guy named Diedrich Bonhoeffer. And most of you probably know who he is, just a reminder. He was a, a German pastor, um, and uh, when the Nazi party came into power, um, uh, he could see what was going on. He actually came to the United States for a, for a time and, and could have remained here safe throughout the war, but he made the decision to go back and to, um, to be part of the church, to try to share the gospel and stand for the truth in the midst of what was going on in Germany. And and he actually, um, as a minister during that time of the Nazi um, regime, he he was seeing people that were believers that were captivated by trying to be friends with this and a friendship with the world, with the, the Nazi regime, because they thought it brought some sense of, of safety. Um, and he wrote these words. And if you know the story of Bonhoeffer, you know that, that eventually he was arrested. He was thrown in prison and he was martyred. He was, um, he was killed. Uh, by the Nazis just days before um, uh, Berlin and where he was uh, actually was liberated. But here is what he wrote about the church. And when the church is confronted with difficult times and we have to make a decision to stand with the truth or not, here's what he said. In obedience and faith alone, the church took up the struggle ordained for her. From the word alone, she may be led for her Lord she gladly gave up all cares, all security, all friendship with the world. Yes, our way leads also through distress, but the Lord bound us not to yield. Do we want to yield today for the sake of friendship with the world? Do we want to sell our calling for the mess of pottage of a safe future? Through our own behavior, we are making the gospel of our church unworthy of belief. Those are pretty strong words, pretty bold words, just like the words of John to the church, where he's saying, it isn't easy. It is not easy to be in this world and to follow Christ because this world is totally opposed to him. This world is of the evil one and Satan uh, is a master of deceit and a master of trickery and, uh, and he is perfectly content with Christians sitting back and not standing for the truth. Um, Bonhoeffer gave his life to, uh, to stand for the truth. Um, and we need to do the same. Be willing to sacrifice our life, even if that's just our, our way of life. Uh, to be obedient to the Father. To be obedient to the truths that are in Scripture. Because as as, uh, as bold as John's instructions are um, throughout this, uh, he also reminded us of, the, of those truths in verses 12, 13, and 14. We, our sins are forgiven for Jesus' name's sake. We know him, the one from the beginning. We have overcome the evil one, not on our own strength, but because the word of God lives in us. So I want to encourage you this week and uh, as you think through this this passage and, and discuss it 
in your um, in your community groups um, to talk about that to talk about our need to be bold and our need to share the gospel um, it would be easy to stay uh, uh, easier to stay confined and stay safe or think we're staying safe by not being confrontational um, and I'm, I'm not saying to to be disrespectful and challenge people in an inappropriate way but we need to to stand for the truth and we need to not be ashamed of the gospel and we need to um, share uh, with those that aren't believers that totally disagree with us um, what the truth is and uh, and that's what we're called to do as believers to love each other to love our brothers and sisters in Christ to not love the world but to stand for the truth so um, let, let's let's pray now Father, we thank you for this time, uh, Father, that, um, that we have studied through this, this passage today. Father, it's, very, uh, it's a very simple passage, um, just sharing the truths of the gospel and a very direct um, call for us to not love this world or the things of the world, but to love you and to trust you in all that we do, Father. And I just pray that we will um, boldly proclaim you um, to this lost world that we live in, Father, and Lord, no matter how easy it would seem to just kind of step back and not um, and, and not speak the truth to others, Father, I pray that you'll just that you'll encourage us to share your love and your truth with the, the people that we that we see on a regular basis and on a daily basis, Father. Lord, I pray that you'll be with us throughout this week, uh, Father, and I just pray um, that we will be able to gather again together soon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Today's benediction is found in 2 Peter verses 17 and 18 says, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away by the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Have a great week.